This is obviously not the the first time at Royal Troon. So in your your lengthy and distinguished history covering this sport, what are you expecting over the next four days? Every British Open venue is is weather dependent, but Troon especially because it's not a very artful golf course. Um, it, that back nine usually, you know, it's one of those those traditional links that goes out and back, and the whole back nine plays into the prevailing wind. And when the wind blows, it is a beast. It, it's one of the hardest tests in golf. So, given how far the guys hit it these days, and that the course is otherwise pretty defenseless. We need some weather. The forecast for tomorrow is is pretty rough, which of course we love as golf fans and observers. You know, you, you don't want blue skies and short sleeves at, at the Open Championship. You want mm -hmm. you want pain and suffering. You want side <laughs> wind. You want umbrellas being blown inside out. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's what it's all about. So, um, I think I think we're gonna have a good championship. Obviously, the last time um, we were at Troon, the epic showdown between Phil Mickelson and Henrik Stenson, and um, even though I don't, I think it's it's one of my least favorite courses on the the Rota. To be honest, it has produced terrific winners. So I, I think it'll be a big boy leaderboard, and and hopefully we get it in another exciting Sunday. You mentioned the weather, and and that's always as as a you know outside golf observer. That's always what strikes me at the British Open because for one thing. For whatever reason, obviously, with the transmission, the TV feed always looks a little bit off. Everything's kind of delayed. So you're watching guys, and everything's kind of blurred, but also you can just see, like, their 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 weatherproof vests almost being ripped off their bodies with every shot. And it seems like ebb and flow. Sometimes it seems totally fine. You watch them on the next hole, and, and you know, Tiger's getting blown over or something. It's, it's a fascinating uh, type of a setting, I think, for golf. And yet you look at the, the favorites just in terms of the betting odds, and it's exactly who you would anticipate being there, which is it's Scotty Scheffler and, and Rory McIlroy at the top. Yeah, it, in wind and and weather, the, the ball striking is really crucial because when you miss hit a shot, the wind it, it amplifies and exaggerates that. Whereas when you hit it flush, it can kind of rip through the, the elements. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's going to be this, the, the ball strikers are, are going to rise to the top. And the greens are pretty flat and slow. You know, it's not Augusta National. It's it's not like Pinehurst, where where the art of putting is is so um, elevated. You know, on these kind of slower, flatter, grainier greens, everybody can make putts, and um, and so it really it really does. Um, and it's not it's not just hitting it flush, but it's having that creativity, playing the different shots, using the wind, uh, using the contours. So. Uh, I mean, the British Open tends to to reward the best ball strikers, but it also has the a long history of kind of quirky winners. And so whether you're talking about Ben Curtis or Todd Hamilton or some of these guys who have come out of nowhere um, and the weather is part of that, you know, every other. Well, the Masters is a small field, but the PGA Championship and the U.S. Open, the other majors with full fields, they tee them off on the, the first and the 10th. Tees and so the the tee time window is compressed. The British opens only the first tee, and so they go from you know they tee off at six thirty in the morning mm -hmm. into three in the afternoon, and so the the draw you get and where you are on the course when the weather comes in or or blows out is really profound. It, weather affects the open more, not just because there's more of it, but because uh, of the the way the tee times fall. Guys, you can get totally hosed. I mean, we we've seen that. You know, Tiger at Muirfield in, in 03 when he's chasing the Grand Slam. Mm -hmm. You know, shot 81 because he had to play into a hurricane. Um, so um, there there is a, a there's a, a flukiness, an element of of chance to the Open, the way the ball bounces and 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 your tee time versus the weather. So that's kind of part of the fun. There, there's a, there's a, a little magic still to uh, to who wins and loses. I honestly don't know the answer to this. Alan Shipnuck is our guest. Uh, how do how do the draws work for the tee time? When it is, I mean, this is not like the coin flip at the start of a football game, and it's like, okay, each team's going to get roughly the same possessions. Like, it literally can be, based on what time you get, can be a completely different conditions. Is it a draw of a hat? Is it an NBA-style lottery? Like, how do they do it? Yeah, it's all it's all done in secret by these these – a uh, dude in tweed jacket, smoking pipes, you know, in a <laughs> wood paneled library. Um, uh, you know, the PGA Tour week to week has a formula. There's an algorithm that that with the tee times at at the Open, it's made. It's just these old boys at the RNA. They just wing it, and so theoretically, everyone gets an early and a late tee time. Um, 
the the marquee players are in the TV windows, of course. If you're a qualifier or uh, a scrub, you're going to go really early or really late. They they try and they try and have the best players a, a little more in the middle of the day, but um, when, you know it just depends on your morning and your afternoon wave. Like when when does when does the weather get gnarly? So um, they they try and balance it so you have one morning and one afternoon tea time, but. Um, there's no accounting for when things are going to get nasty. So that that's that's part of the fun. It's part of the parlor game, how the RNA, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St. Andrews, which handles the tee times, how do they, um, which by the way, isn't that just a great name? Like as a ruling body, it's so funny, the Royal and Ancient. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, there, there's, a, there's, there's an art and, and a science and a lot of mystery baked into the tee times. Yeah, Al, Al and Chris here, you talk about the draw and the tee times. And you talk about a guy who's really come on. He's really only been playing for a year, Ludwig Oberg. He has a chance to really win this thing. And you saw him get frustrated with slow play last week. Now he's paired with Bryson DeChambeau and Tom Kim, two of the slowest players on door. Like Ludwig's kind of getting screwed here, no? Yes and no. I mean, the the open is always slow because, you know, playing in threesomes and, um, a lot of guys backing off shots, trying to read the wind. You hit it into the heather. It's a, it's a, it can be a long look for your golf ball. Guys have misadventures in the pot bunkers. I mean, it's just never fast over there, which is ironic because if you go play recreationally um, and, you, you know, the members of the clubs are up your ass if you play in, in you know, <laughs> lower than three hours and 45 minutes. So uh, it's kind of a mixed message. But, uh, yeah, so it's – um that's just part of championship golf. Unfortunately, the fast players usually have to bend to the will of the slow players. It's rarely the other way around, which is unfortunate. And it's a competitive disadvantage for a guy like Ludwig, but um, that if that's part of the mental battle. You know, the, the U.S. Open, the rounds can be five and a half hours because guys are shooting 85. So it's just, if you want to prevail at the majors, you have to learn to deal with all of the things that are coming at you, which is the media attention, much larger fans, all the hype and obviously the exacting court conditions, but slow play is part of it. It just really is. I mean, it's an issue week to week. It's exaggerated the majors because the setups are so much tougher. So um, unfortunately he's going to have to learn to walk a little slower mm -hmm. and take a few more deep breaths and, and try and that's just one more thing you have to overcome. I can't quit Rory. So I'm going to keep picking him, but <laughs> who do you think ultimately lifts the Claret jug on Sunday? You know, I have I have a sneaky feeling about John Rahm. Oh. He's been playing very well on Live Golf, and no one's been paying attention. Um, he sent his press conference that his his game is where he wants it to be, and uh, finally, and he's a guy who has immense pride, and he's been largely forgotten this year because he hasn't played well in the majors. He hasn't even won a Live Golf event, and this is like we were talking about with Roy, this is your last chance to change your whole year. If you win, if you win the open championship, it's been a spectacular year, no matter what else has happened. So um, he's one of those guys who hits it so good. He knows how to play over there. He's, he's played a lot of links golf. Um, I think, you know, what happened last weekend with Spain, the sort of the triple decker yeah. <laughs> of, of the euros Wimbledon. And then even his buddy Sergio won the live event in Spain and his team won over there. Um, I think Ron feels left out. I, feel, I think he feels marginalized and I think he's tired of it. So I, I think he's going to bring it, but, um, you know, again, Scotty Scheffler is the betting favorite for a reason. He hits a ball significantly better than anyone else in golf. And, um, that's paramount. So you, you can never go wrong betting chalk on Scotty, but, uh, I'll, I'll take Rom as kind of a, an, uh, a surprise choice. Catch the Rich Eisen show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to three Eastern for free.